You know, it's good to be back. It's good to see you all. Would you just stand with me as we begin our worship time today by reading from Psalm 130. The words are on the screen. Psalm 130, a song of ascents. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let my ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning. More than the watchman for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. He will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. Psalm 130. Would you join me in prayer? God, we just thank you so much for this day. We recognize that as we come here today, we bring many things with us. Would you help our hearts tune into you today to join with the psalmist in praising you and remembering you, the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf, We just pray that through the word and the singing and the prayers, Lord, you would be lifted up. We'd be drawn close to you. God, and your gospel would be proclaimed. Would you do all these things for the glory of your name? We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Psalm 77, verses 13 and 14 says, Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God. You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. Oh 
as we sing of God's love, let me read Ephesians 5, verse 2. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died He for me who caused His pain, for me who Him to death pursued. Amazing love, how die for me amazing love how can it be that thou my God choose die for me he left his father's throne Good morning, church. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles this morning to Hebrews chapter 4, 
Uh, we're going to start at verse 14 and then read into chapter 5. My name is Daniel. I'm from Australia. It's my uh, privilege to read the word with you this morning. Jesus, the great high priest. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honour for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him, who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Would you bow your heads and join me in prayer this morning? Oh God... come before you this morning in awe. God, when we see the universe we live in, it's filled with such beauty, with stars that are uncountable, with a universe full of light and colors and gracefulness and beauty. We marvel that you are so much greater than us. Your thoughts are higher than ours. Your Ways are beyond our ability to understand. You are holy, holy, holy. And the whole earth proclaims your greatness and your beauty. And we desire to worship you. You are our greatest treasure. And in your holiness sometimes, Lord, we confess that you often feel too big for us. We're not worthy of you. Our consciences tell us that this is true. Those people we live with and work with and study with, they can see our sins. How can you not? And we confess that we often avoid you. Sometimes we ignore you. We can confess that at times we try to soothe our consciences by comparing ourselves to people who are more sinful than us. We confess that we work to earn your love. And we do good things to gain your favor. Lord, would you forgive us this morning for choosing our way of salvation instead of yours? Would you forgive us this morning for running from you at times? Would you bring peace and assurance to our hearts today? We pray that you would remind us that in all our life and our troubles and the struggles we go through, that we are not alone. Would you remind us that we have a divine helper? Remind us that Jesus is on our side. Remind us that we have a mediator like no other. Show us our spotless, sinless, perfect high priest that has passed through the heavens and now sits at your right hand this morning. Teach us to draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and grace. Give us Jesus. 
We intercede for our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan this morning. God, we ask that as the fire of persecution comes, that you would strengthen your people. Lord, you have said that not a hair on our head will fall to the ground apart from your will. And so we come to you this morning and we earnestly ask you, would you save, heal, protect, and give courage to your people during this time? Help those that even God will be called to make the ultimate sacrifice for you. Would you give them grace? We lift up the government of the UAE to you this morning. We ask that you would guide and protect our governmental leaders. Give them grace to govern well in these times and help us to continue to receive favor and to have more and more freedom to worship as before the pandemic. God, we lift up Pastor John Norris at Redeemer Alain this morning. Would you give the church in Alain grace to testify, to bless the people around them with your gospel and with your love? And lastly, I lift up our dear pastor to you this morning. Would you give him confidence and boldness to proclaim your word, peace and love for people here today, Wisdom to say everything you want him to say. And oh, teacher, our beloved Holy Spirit, would you come this morning through Pastor Aubrey? Teach us. We give this service and everything to you for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please uh, open your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 8. We're looking at chapters 8 through 10 this morning. So Leviticus chapter 8, and you pray with me one more time. Heavenly Father, I pray that through your word this morning, you would reveal to us the excellencies of our mediator, our high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. Give us confidence to draw near through him with reverence and awe and offer acceptable worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever had an experience where there was a rising sense of joy and excitement, and yet you feel terrified and awestruck at the same time? This mix of affections, of feelings inside you. You know, I think of maybe when you're hiking, or you're up on a hill, or you come to the edge of a cliff and you're looking out over the scenery, there's, there's just this great sense of joy and at the same time, rightful fear, terror. Or maybe if you're one of those who has ridden the Formula Rosa or you like roller coasters, you think of that moment when the roller coaster is you know, right, right at the top, coming up to the top and there's this excitement inside at the same time, you're more terrified than words can say. I had an experience like this many years ago of probably not having the right kind of fear, not enough fear at least. Uh, I was in uh, India in the hills in a town called Uti, and uh, I was, you know, going through with my friends uh, through some rough area, which is exploring, and we saw uh, an Indian gaur, which uh, is, is a relative of the bison, which uh, an adult male can stand up to seven feet tall and weigh over 1,500 kilos. What I didn't know at that time is it's quite frequent for people to die by venturing too close to the gaur. And so... You know, just like when you draw near to the edge of the cliff or draw near to the top of the roller coaster, we are drawing near to get a closer look at this magnificent beast. And there was excitement. And, you know, the beast kept walking away. And uh, this was back in the day. We didn't have smartphones. We had the little, the old, uh, but the phone did have a camera and trying to get uh, this creature on film. And uh, there was a sense of excitement, maybe a little fear, not enough. Well, we got close enough that it came charging out at us. And uh, we ran in seven different directions. I I just remember a blur of fear and adrenaline. And uh, I've never run like that ever in my life. A a mix of joy and fear as we draw near. 
That's what worshipping God should be like. We have to remember as we approach the God of the Bible, our holy God, that He is both our greatest joy and also our greatest threat. Drawing near to God, approaching Him, coming into His presence is no small matter. We must come to Him. It's in His presence that we find fullness of life. And yet, even as we come, we must come with reverence and awe. We must come as He has commanded us and not in our own way. Well, in Leviticus chapters 8 to 10, this is what we will see. We, we see the great joy of drawing near to God through His appointed mediator. And at the same time, we are cautioned by the great danger of drawing near without following His commands, without recognizing His holiness. So in this passage, we, we see the joy of drawing near to God our, through our perfect mediator. At the same time, God wants us to feel fear and reverence, appropriate fear, with which we must worship, worship Him and offer acceptable worship as He commands. And so in these three chapters, we're going to look at three instructions that God gives us for drawing near to His glorious, holy presence. Each chapter will give us one instruction. And the first one is, we must draw near through God's mediator. We must draw near through God's mediator. This is in chapter 8. Look at chapter 8, verses 1 to 4. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments, and the anointing oil, and the bull of the sin offering, and the two rams, and the basket of unleavened bread, and assemble all the congregation at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and the congregation was assembled at the entrance of the tent of meeting. So as we've been following through Leviticus, we've seen seven chapters of instructions on sacrifice, and now we're entering a new section where God is commanding Moses to take Aaron and his sons and to conduct a special ceremony. Remember the theme of Leviticus, God wants us, wants His people to draw near to Him. He wants to bless His people. He wants His people to experience the blessing of life in His presence. That's the goal of Leviticus, to draw near to the Holy One, to live in God's presence. And last week we saw that to draw near to God, we must come through sacrifice, through the shedding of blood. And this week we see a second crucial requirement for life in God's presence, to be able to approach God. We must draw near through a mediator, through a mediator, specifically God's appointed mediator. How can sinful people draw near to the Holy Lord? The answer is through God's chosen mediator through the priesthood that God provides. Now, now what do we mean by mediator? You, you all should be familiar with this, even living in the UAE. A mediator is, is someone who is a go-between, who acts as a representative on your behalf. Uh, you think of the PRO, who helps you get your visa, who acts as your representative uh, before the UAE immigration authorities. That's a mediator. And, and here we are seeing what it means to have a mediator before God. God is giving us the Levitical priesthood. He gives His people priests. And in these chapters, the Bible is very careful to define what it means to be a priest for the true and living God. Remember, Israel had come out of Egypt and in the nation of Egypt, they were no stranger to priests. The nation of Egypt had priests. Uh, the other pagan nations around them had priests who worshipped particular gods. Well, God's priests are meant to be entirely different. God is very careful to describe who His priests are, how they are chosen, and what they 
do. So here in chapter 8, we're seeing this important event, the inauguration of this priesthood, the installation of Aaron as high priest and of Aaron and his sons, his line, as the priesthood before the Lord. And we'll see this is a deeply solemn uh, occasion. It's a very significant moment in Israel's history. And, and we'll see that this chapter lays out for us uh, four aspects of God's mediator. Four aspects of God's mediator. First, we see the mediator's calling. The mediator's calling. Not anyone could become the high priest. This was the most holy office in Israel. And, and the person in this office was chosen, was called, was appointed by God himself. No one could rise up and say, I want to stand for election as high priest, or I aspire to the office of high priest. No, no. God is the one who appoints. It's the Lord who must take the initiative. He recognizes his people's need for a mediator to draw near. He orchestrates and ordains that way for them to draw near. So he takes the initiative, as it always is. He's the one who provides sacrifice. He's the one who appoints a mediator. He chooses, he calls, he installs, he appoints. That's what we see in verses 1 and 2. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him. And that's a picture again for us of the amazing grace of God. That God takes the initiative to make a way for his people to draw near. That God chooses and God appoints. He speaks. He works to draw us near to him. So we see the mediator's calling. Later in Leviticus, in chapters 21 and 22, we'll see further instructions for priests. And, and we see also that even within Aaron's family line, there were many requirements. Uh, they, uh, no one with a defect, for example, or a disability could serve as priest. These men were supposed to be whole and without blemish because they represent and point forward to the heavenly state. What it means to be like in the presence of God in eternity. And therefore, there were many requirements that were placed by God on who could come and serve as a priest. So first, the mediator's calling. Next, we see the mediator's clothing. The mediator's clothing. We'll see here God's mediator, the high priest, receiving special garments. Right? Look with me from verses 5. And Moses said to the congregation, This is the thing that the Lord has commanded to be done. And Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. And he put the coat on him and tied the sash around his waist and clothed him with the robe and put the ephod on him and tied the skillfully woven band of the ephod around him, binding it to him with the band. And he placed the breastpiece on him. And in the breastpiece, he put the urim and the thummim. And he set the turban on his head, and on the turban in front he set the golden plate, the holy crown, as the Lord commanded Moses. Then Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was in it and consecrated them. And he sprinkled some of it on the altar seven times and anointed the altar and all its utensils and the basin and its stand to consecrate them. And he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. And Moses brought Aaron's sons and clothed them with coats and tied sashes around their waists, and bound caps on them as the Lord commanded Moses. So here God is commanding Moses to clothe Aaron, and Aaron and the priests have these dazzling garments placed upon them uh, with this plate uh, at the front of their foreheads, which read, the words there were written, holy to the Lord. And there's a significance in them wearing these uniforms. I mean, we're familiar with uniforms in society, you know, school kids, familiar, some of you, with uniforms that you have to wear to school. You know, you walk into uh, any mall here, you see someone at the door standing in uniform, security guard, 
What's, what's, the, what's the function of a uniform? What's the purpose of a uniform? As one person says, the uniform draws attention to the office or function of a person as opposed to his individual personality. It emphasizes his job rather than his name. And so these beautiful vestments drew attention to the supreme dignity and holiness of the high priestly office. He was the mediator between God and man. He secured atonement for the nation's sin, and his costly garments symbolized the value of his ministry to the nation. The uniform worn by the priest also had a royal quality to it. They were like kingly robes, and it demonstrated that this nation, Israel, was to represent God's kingdom on earth. They were a kingdom special to God. The emphasis is on the office, the function of these mediators, of these priests. That's why they receive these special clothes. In some ways, it's, it's a good word for church leadership and church leaders today as well, is that we ought to focus on the office, the function of the person, what they are supposed to do, rather than the individual personality. So we see the mediator's calling, the mediator's clothing. Next we see the mediator's cleansing, the mediator's cleansing. Look with me at verse 14. Then he brought the bull of the sin offering, that's Moses bringing the bull of the sin offering, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the bull of the sin offering, and he killed it. And Moses took the blood and with his finger put it on the horns of the altar around it and purified the altar and poured out the blood at the base of the altar and consecrated it to make atonement for it. And he took all the fat that was on the entrails and the long lobe of the liver and the two kidneys with their fat and Moses burned them on the altar. But the bull and its skin and its flesh and its dung he burned up with fire outside the camp as the Lord commanded Moses. Then he presented the ram of the burnt offering and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the ram, and he killed it. And Moses threw the blood against the sides of the altar. He cut the ram into pieces, and Moses burned the head and the pieces and the fat. He washed the entrails and the legs with water, and Moses burned the whole ram on the altar. It was a burnt offering with a pleasing aroma, a food offering for the Lord as the Lord commanded Moses. And so we see the beginning of the installation of these mediators, of these priests, was to happen with sacrifice, sacrifices being offered. And there, there is a recognition that even these priests who are holy to the Lord, who are going to represent God's people, are sinful men representing a sinful people. We, we see again the offerings, the sacrifices with which you should be familiar now, even from last week. First, the sin offering for cleansing for purification from sin, from the pollution of sin. Then the burnt offering to propitiate God's wrath. That's an important word from last week, if you remember. Propitiation, to turn away the wrath of God, the judgment of God. And then after that, we'll see a special offering being made. This is an ordination offering. It's a variation of the fellowship of peace offering we saw from last week. Here it is an ordination offering. Look at verse 22 and following. Then he presented the other ram, the ram of ordination. And Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the ram, and he killed it. And Moses took some of its blood and put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear, and on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. Then he presented Aaron's sons and Moses put some of the blood on the lobes of their right ears and on the thumbs of their right hands and on the big toes of their right feet. And Moses threw the blood against the sides of the altar. Then he took the fat and the fat tail and all the fat that was on the entrails and the long lobe of the liver and the two kidneys with their fat and the right thigh. And out of the basket of unleavened bread that was before the Lord, he took one unleavened loaf and one loaf of bread with oil and one wafer and placed them on the pieces of fat and on the right thigh. And he put all these in the hands of Aaron and the hands of his son and waved them as a wave offering before the Lord. Then Moses took them from their hands and burned them on the altar with the burnt offering. This was an ordination offering with a pleasing aroma, a food offering to the Lord. And Moses took the breast 
and waved it for a wave offering before the Lord. It was Moses' portion of the ram of ordination as the Lord commanded Moses. So you see him slaughter here, this ram, and then you see this very particular kind of peculiar ritual where he's taking blood from this sacrifice, and he places it on the right ear, and then on the right thumb, and then down on the right big toe. What's going on there? Uh, he is installing, ordaining the priests, and it symbolizes purification literally from head to toe. The whole man belongs to God, must be purified from sin, must use all his organs to serve God. Why the right side? Because the right is typically the dominant side. Why the ear? Because now the priest's ears are consecrated to hear God's word, to hear God's instruction, to listen to God. Why the right hand? Because now the priest's hands belong to God. They're purified in order to serve God, to use their hands for the service of God. Why the right toe, big toe of the right foot? It's again to show that the priest's feet are consecrated, that they may be those who walk in God's ways and teach others to do the same. And why are we using blood here? Because once again we are reminded these are weak and sinful men representing sinful people. That, that reminder comes again and again. You see every sacrificial animal and almost every type of offering covered in these two chapters, chapters 8 and 9, Chapter 9, they're going to have a worship service and a ceremony with all the people. And chapter 9 again begins with sacrifices, offerings being made for the priests. Chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. And no, uh, see if you can notice something here very interesting. On the eighth day, so this is uh, after seven days when, you know, the priests have been kept inside and consecrated. On the eighth day, Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders of Israel. And he said to Aaron, take for yourself a bull calf. For a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering, both without blemish, and offer them before the Lord. So, once again, sacrifices must be offered for the priests. Did you notice what was specified for the sacrifice, the offering to be made for Aaron himself? A bull calf. Typically, it was a bull that was offered. Why do we have a calf here? You got to think back to Aaron's history. Because in the book of Exodus, Aaron, when Moses was gone, led the people in building, in putting together a golden calf as an idol to worship. And here that same Aaron has been called, forgiven, and appointed by God to the high priesthood. And he must offer a bull calf in atonement for his sin. And so even in the cleansing of these mediators, we are reminded of the universality and the power of sin. Even the priests are not free from sin. Even the priests of God, these mediators, these men who will act as middlemen, as representatives between God and man, they themselves are sinful, not free from sin and its effects. So we saw the mediators calling Clothing, cleansing, finally we see the mediator's consecration. Mediator's consecration. Aaron and his sons are consecrated. They are devoted to the service of God now. They are set apart for God and his purposes to serve God as priests. Verses 10 to 12 of chapter 8. Then Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was in it and consecrated them. And he sprinkled some of it on the altar seven times and anointed the altar and all its utensils and the basin and its stand to consecrate them. And he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. Verses 30 to 36. Then Moses took some of the anointing oil and of the blood that was on the altar and sprinkled it on Aaron and his garments and also on his sons and his sons' garments. So he consecrated Aaron and his garments and his sons and his sons' garments with him. And Moses said to Aaron and his sons, Boil the flesh at the entrance of the tent of meeting and there eat it. And the bread that is in the basket of the ordination offerings as I commanded, saying, Aaron and his sons shall eat it. And what remains of the flesh and bread you shall burn up with fire. And you shall not go outside the entrance of the tent of meeting for seven days until the days of your ordination are completed, for it will take seven days to ordain you. 
As has been done today, the Lord has commanded to be done to make atonement for you. At the entrance of the tent of meeting, you shall remain day and night for seven days, performing what the Lord has charged, so that you do not die. For so I have been commanded. And Aaron and his sons did all the things that the Lord commanded by Moses. Now these men have been consecrated and set apart for service to God. They are to stay after the installation. That's not complete until they stay inside the tabernacle, inside the tent of meeting there, for seven days. Right? That's where they're going to be at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Why seven days? Seven signifies completion. The complete consecration of these men to God. Seven also signifies something else. Where else do we see seven days in the Bible? You go back to the beginning where God created the heavens and the earth in seven days. And so here this tabernacle, this tent, is going to act like a new creation, like a new Eden If you remember from two weeks ago, I showed you several correspondences between the tabernacle and the Garden of Eden. This is a new Eden where God's presence dwells in all his fullness. And Aaron and his sons will represent God's people in this glorious service like Adam in the garden. And so God provided and consecrated these men as as his priests, as his mediators, who would represent his people to him and represent him to the people. And they had three main functions as mediators. Three main functions. First, to make atonement for the people. They were the one who, the ones who were handling all the sacrifices, who were handling all the blood, making atonement for people's sins. They had a second function. They were to make intercession for the people. They were to stand as advocates, just like a lawyer is a mediator. They were to stand as advocates, pleading for, to God, our great judge, our divine judge, pleading on behalf of the people, praying for God's people. And third, they were to teach God's people. They were to teach God's people the law, helping God's people understand what's the difference between holy and unholy, what's the difference between clean and unclean. They were special men, serving in a special place with a special purpose. We no longer have these kind of priests. My visa says priest, but I'm not this kind of priest. Okay? Uh, But we do have a mediator. In fact, God has provided us with a far better mediator than these priests. Just like these priests, just like Aaron was called, chosen, and appointed, God has chosen this mediator. He has appointed this mediator for us. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says, There is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And we see that not only is he similar to those mediators in the sense that he is called and appointed by God, but he is far better than those mediators, far greater than those mediators. As Hebrews chapter 7 tells us, verses 23 to 28, the former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he, that is Jesus, holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, God's own oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Brothers and sisters, our mediator is the son of God himself. God the son made flesh for us, who stands between us and God, who allows us through him to draw near to God, Jesus Christ. He is the mediator who has made a perfect sacrifice, who has made perfect atonement by offering up himself so that all our sins might be forgiven. He is the mediator who is risen from the dead and is seated at God's right hand. And always, always, 
every day, every hour, 24-7 is making intercession for us as the people of God. He is the only one through whom we can draw near to God. The Westminster Shorter Catechism has this question. I love it. How does Christ execute the office of a priest? And the answer is, Christ executes the office of a priest in his once offering up for him, of himself as a sacrifice to satisfy divine justice and reconcile us to God and in making continual intercession for us. Our high priest, our mediator, is without sin, is holy, is perfect, will never fail. He is always living, always making intercession. Think about that. Jesus, the Son of God, the perfect, spotless Son of God is praying right now in this moment, every day and night, is praying, interceding for you. You know, ever had those moments when you're having a tough day or a tough morning and you receive all of a sudden a WhatsApp from a friend or a fellow church member just saying, just thinking of you this morning, praying for you. I, as a pastor, I receive these emails, and I'm so blessed by these emails, you know, or, or WhatsApps, like, pastor, praying for you, praying for the preaching of your word. And it's such an encouragement. Well, here, here's, here's a message for you. Jesus is praying for you every day, every night. When you feel weak and weighed down by your own sin, your guilt before God, Jesus is praying for you. When you're depressed Anxious, I know what that's like. I've struggled with depression. When you, when you feel downcast and weary, Jesus is praying for you. When you are falsely accused by Satan or by others, you feel the weight of false accusation, Jesus is praying for you. Your perfect mediator has offered a perfect sacrifice to cleanse your sins forever, and he prays for you day and night. And I want to speak to you here this morning, if, if you're here and you do not know Jesus, if you do not have him as your mediator, if you're here, non-Christian friend, I, I want to speak to you and, and to tell you, to share with you that God is holy. He is perfect in all his ways. He is our creator and our judge. We are sinful. We have sinned and rebelled against God and we stand guilty and condemned in his sight. And the only way, the only way to a relationship with God, the only way to be forgiven of sin, the only way to have hope and freedom from judgment for sin is through Jesus. He is the only mediator between God and man. He is the only one and the only way. There is no other way. So if you're here and you do not know him, I want to call you to turn from your sin, to repent of sin, and to flee into the arms of this Savior. To put your trust in this mediator who draws sinful people close to our holy God. Not only does God provide a mediator by which his people can draw near to him. But the result of drawing near to God through his appointed mediator is that we receive the joy and blessing of his presence of his presence with us. So first we saw we must draw near to God through his appointed mediator. Second, we'll see this in chapter 9, we must draw near to be blessed by God's presence. We must draw near to be blessed by God's presence. So the priests have been installed, they've been consecrated, and then in chapter 9 there is a public worship service for the congregation to participate in. The congregation is now going to draw near to God through this new priestly office. And throughout this chapter, we'll see the emphasis on God appearing to bless his people as they draw near to him in worship. First, we see the expectation of God's presence. The expectation of God's presence. Verse 4, look at verse 4. Moses speaks to the people and says, Today the Lord will appear to you. There, at the end of verse 4. And again, again in verse 6, Moses said, This is the thing that the Lord commanded you to do, that the glory of the Lord 
may appear to you. There's an expectation and anticipation that God is going to appear, that God in all his glory is going to show up. And you've got to remember there's been a lot of suspense in the story so far. You remember how the book of Exodus ends just before we enter the book of Leviticus. At the end of Exodus chapter 40 verses 34 and 35, we read this. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So after several chapters of instructions on how to build this tabernacle, after several chapters of showing us how they built this tabernacle where God is going to come, the glory of the Lord comes down and fills the tent of meeting, fills the tabernacle. What an awesome spectacle. God among his people once again. But then what happens? Verse 35. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses himself is unable to draw near, is unable to enter into God's presence as God fills this tabernacle. It's very significant, you know, in the storyline of the Bible. Think about it. When was the last time that there was this kind of nearness between God and people? When was the last time when people could dwell in God's presence freely? It's way back in Genesis chapters 1 and 2 where Adam and Eve in the garden experienced fellowship and nearness with God in His presence as God walked in their midst as they they could experience unhindered fellowship and nearness to God. God comes again in power, Exodus chapter 19 to 24 at Mount Sinai but the people are at a distance. They're kept at a great distance from God. It's frightening. They dare not draw near. And now God's glory has come and filled this tabernacle, indicating that he intends to dwell with his people. But even Moses cannot enter. And then in the book of Leviticus, the Lord speaks and gives instructions about sacrifice. The Lord speaks and installs the priesthood to act as mediators. And now the Lord promises that he is going to appear and he calls his people to draw near to him in worship. Verses 5 and following, notice the emphasis on drawing near. And they brought what Moses commanded in front of the tent of meeting, and all the congregation drew near and stood before the Lord. Notice verse 7, Moses said to Aaron, draw near to the altar and offer your sin offering. Notice verse verse 8, so Aaron drew near to the altar. The Lord is going to give his people the blessing of his appearing, of his presence. So there's an expectation, an anticipation of the Lord's presence. Next we see preparation for God's presence. Preparation for God's presence. First, the sacrifices for the leaders themselves, because these leaders, these mediators are sinful. That's what we see. And then we see sacrifices for the people, verses 15 to 18. He presented the people's offering and took the goat of the sin offering that was for the people and killed it and offered it as a sin offering like the first one. And he presented the burnt offering and offered it according to the rule. And he presented the grain offering, took a handful of it and burned it on the altar besides the burnt offering of the morning. Then he killed the ox and the ram, the sacrifice of peace offerings for the people. And Aaron's sons handed him the blood and he threw it against the sides of the altar. So again, a little bit revision from last week. If you notice, there's a very particular order in which these sacrifices are offered. First, the sin offering. The sin offering to make purification for sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And so the blood of the sin offering here poured out, indicating that a death has occurred, a substitution has been made, results in purification from sin. Next, the burnt offering. The burnt offering turns away the wrath of God, achieves propitiation by giving a soothing aroma to the Lord, quenches God's judgment, absorbs the judgment of God. Next, the grain offering. And the grain offering now symbolizes the believers, the worshippers' devotion to God, consecration that they are drawing near in devotion. And finally, the peace or fellowship offering, which is eaten. This offering is eaten. Why? Because it's a fellowship meal, indicating that reconciliation has taken place. And now we have peace and fellowship with God Almighty. So there's great preparation, expectation, and then preparation for God's presence. And finally, 
the revelation of God's presence. We see the chapter close with the revelation of God's presence. Revelation and the people's response. Verses 22 to 24. Then Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them. And he came down from offering the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. And when they came out, they blessed the people and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the pieces of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. The Lord has arrived. He reveals himself. He comes in fire and glory. And, and notice verse 23. Exodus ended with Moses not being able to enter in. But now Moses and Aaron have access. They were able to enter into the tent of meeting. And when they come out, they bless the people. The glory of the Lord appears to his people for the first time since the Garden of Eden. The Lord God Almighty is dwelling in the midst of his people once again. Through the way that God has appointed, through sacrifices, through priesthood, the people are able to live in God's presence and to taste God's glory. How do they respond? Verse 24. When the people all saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. They respond with great joy and great reverence fear of the Lord. This is an awesome thing. This is the way worship always works. Worship is an act of revelation and response. God reveals himself. We respond to his self-revelation. That's what happens here each week where God reveals himself through his word, through his spirit, and we respond to his revelation with joy and fear. Brothers and sisters, just like these people experienced and tasted the glory of God, of his presence, we too have an opportunity, a great privilege of experiencing and tasting the glory of God in this way. We have the privilege of drawing near, to draw near to him, to witness his self-revelation in a far greater way than Moses, in a much greater way than Aaron and these people. And we experience this every week here in congregational worship. I want to ask you, does your heart, as you prepare to come here Friday morning, does your heart grow with expectation and anticipation for the Lord's presence, for the Lord's self-revelation each week? Do you prepare yourself to come? Fixing your heart in faith upon Christ's sacrifice and him as your great high priest and entering into the assembly of God's people with joy and reverence. You know, this gathering with the saints, us, our assembly together, just like in Leviticus 9, this is the most important thing. This is the most important two-hour slice of your day every week. It's the most important two hours of your week. Because we are meeting as God's people with our creator, our savior, our redeemer. I say this in all our new members' classes. The most important two hours of your life every week is when we meet with God in congregational worship. And, and it involves drawing near. It means assembling physically. Yeah, I know this season has been subnormal. I know there are all kinds of hindrances and limitations. I know it's hard. But this is what God calls us to. He invites us to draw near. Watching online, it's just not the same thing. You don't experience the revelation of God's glory sitting at home in pajamas with coffee. It's when we're here together with the people of God as we fall on our faces before the Holy One. We come through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, through His perfect priesthood, it's our privilege to worship the Lord with joy and fear. And it's in worshiping Him together, preeminently, that we grow in the blessing of knowing Him and seeing His glory. That's what worship is all about, the glory of God. And the people here experienced this blessing. They experienced this glory, God's presence like never before. 
But suddenly, this occasion of triumph turns into tragedy. Because the God who consumes the sacrifice with fire, giving his blessing, shows that he is a consuming fire in judgment as well. You see, when we worship the Holy One, our Creator, the Lord God Almighty, when we worship Him, when we draw near to Him, we must come as He commands. And that leads to our third instruction today concerning drawing near to God. First, we draw near through God's mediator. Second, we draw near to be blessed by God's presence. And third, we must draw near according to God's commands. Chapter 10, look at verse 1. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So you've just read this great, awesome appearing of God's glory at the end of chapter 9. And then chapter 10, it looks routine. Each of the verbs in the first part of the sentence is totally normal and expected for priests. Each of them took his censer, put fire in it, laid incense on it, and offered. Everything seems normal up to that point. But then there's a surprise. They offered unauthorized fire. An offering which the Lord had not commanded. And that's a striking contrast to what we've seen in the previous chapters, where everything was done according to God's commands. Notice the end of chapter 8, verse 36. And Aaron and his sons did all the things that the Lord commanded by Moses. Or look at chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. Moses said, this is the thing that the Lord commanded you to do. At the end of verse 7. Right? They bring the offering of the people and make atonement for them as the Lord has commanded. That phrase is like a drumbeat throughout chapters 8 and 9. As the Lord commanded. As the Lord commanded. And here suddenly we are surprised when Nadab and Abihu try to worship God in a way that he has not commanded. How does the Lord respond? Verse 2, and fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them. And they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. And before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. The God who came in fire to consume the sacrifices which he had commanded, now comes in fire and consumes those who dare to offer what he has not commanded. And, you know, you can think of Nadab and Abihu. These guys were probably enthusiastic. They were probably very zealous, seeking to worship. We have no sign that their intentions were bad. They're seeking to worship. But they do what God has not commanded them to do. They dare to draw near to the Holy One in a way that they've invented in their own imagination. And the result is their immediate death. Does that bother you? Does that trouble you, maybe? Dear friend, if you're troubled by that, if you're asking the question, how can God act that way? The only reason can be is that in your mind, the holiness and majesty of God is not sufficiently large. It's been diminished. This is a common problem in evangelical Christianity. We've lost our sense of the holiness, the grandeur, the greatness, the majesty of God Almighty. We have reduced God. We suffer from what one theologian calls the weightlessness of God in our minds and in our hearts. And this affects how we worship. You see, friends, there are two kinds of idolatry in the Bible. The first kind of idolatry is when you worship the wrong God. The second kind of idolatry is just as dangerous, and it is when you seek to worship the right God, but in the wrong way, in a way invented by our own minds, in a way that we've imagined. I love how this classic Protestant confession describes worship. Listen to this. The acceptable way of worshiping the true God. The acceptable way of worshiping the true God is instituted by himself. 
and so limited by his own revealed will that he may not be worshipped according to the imaginations and devices of men or the suggestions of Satan under any visible representation or under any other way not prescribed in the Holy Scripture. We don't have freedom in corporate congregational worship to do whatever we want. God does not permit us to come and invent our own ways of worshiping him with any kind of a show. Aaron's sons sought to worship according to their own imagination, their own devices, and they faced judgment. This is applicable to us today as God's people. We must not, we cannot, we dare not draw near to God to worship him in a way that he has not explicitly prescribed in Scripture. You know, the great theologian Charles Spurgeon, the, the pastor, said once at one time, he said, there is coming a day when instead of shepherds who feed the sheep, there will be clowns who entertain the goats. We see this problem all throughout evangelical Christianity today, where worship has been reduced to entertainment, to making us feel nice, to be entertained. This is why, by the way, at ECC, we aim to keep our worship, worship services simply biblical, simply biblical, seeking to worship as God has commanded in the New Testament, according to Scripture. We read the Bible, we pray the Bible, we sing the Bible, we preach the Bible, and then we see the Bible in baptism and the Lord's Supper. Ordinary, simple means of grace that God has appointed to powerfully reveal His presence and glory in Christ. So the day of great joy and triumph also turns into a day of great terror and tragedy. And we see that under the old covenant, even with the joy of God's presence, there was distance. We see that even the mediators that God appointed were flawed. They were flawed and sinful. The priests are the first deaths recorded after God comes in glory to his people. And here again, the book of Leviticus is teaching us, reminding us, showing us that we need a better mediator. We need a better priest who would offer a better sacrifice, who would keep God's commands, and who would truly draw us near to God. And God has provided us this mediator in our Lord Jesus Christ. The mediator who is God's own son, who has no sin, who offers a perfect sacrifice, not the blood of bulls and goats, but his own body and blood to make us perfect. And through our perfect mediator, we can draw near to experience joy and fear and respond with reverence to God's revelation. If you had any thought that somehow in the New Testament, worship becomes lighter or more casual, listen to these beautiful words from Hebrews 12, with which we'll close. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel, verse 28 and 29. Therefore, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would respond with reverence and awe at your self-revelation. Thank you for our mediator, Jesus. In his name, amen. Would you stand with us?
announcements before we leave uh, this morning. Uh, I just want to welcome you this morning. If you're new and you're visiting us today, we just want to make you feel welcome. We'd like to get to know you and also we would like for you to be able to know us at ECC. So on the screen you'll see there you can connect in several different ways and we would really appreciate if you reach out to us and we can try to get connected. Second thing I want to tell you this morning is that the the Gulf Theological Seminary runs a foundations course. And so that foundations course will give you the opportunity to go through the Bible, and it's going to give you every uh, book of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and every major doctrine of the Christian faith in one year. So you're going to cover from a very high level. It's very good. This week is the last week to sign up. So just be aware of that. If you're interested, make sure you seek that out. Also, just want to remind you, uh, members particularly to please look for an important announcement coming about the new associate pastor candidate okay so look for that coming soon and one more thing several people from ECC after uh, around lunchtime are meeting in Alwala Mall to eat lunch so if you'd like to join anybody that's a, a invitation out there to anyone that would like to come so closing today with the benediction and just thinking about Jesus as our high priest. Would you stand with me and we receive this benediction today? This comes from the book of Numbers, chapter 6 and verse 24. But I want you to hear, this was the blessing of the priest. This morning as we go, I just want you to think that Jesus Christ is praying this over you this morning. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. 
the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.